salutations. As we pry open our Bibles tonight or tap the device to the letter we call Colossians, a letter that the Apostle Paul writes to this early church, this young church in the ancient city of Colossae. He writes this by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, a, an apostle writing to these Christians, this local body or local family of Jesus' people, of God's people. And we, we simply usually just call it today Colossians. We say turn to Colossians. Or we might say the letter to the Colossians. But in the first two verses, you have Paul's greeting. Most of the letters we have in our Bible, not all of them, but most of them have some type of salutation or greeting that you find at the beginning. They, most of them also have some type of ending greeting or send-off. Paul is, is fond of having a string of short little commands and encouragements as he's winding down. He kind of has a crescendo moment. It goes up really quickly. There's a pick, tempo pickup, and then it ends with something like, Grace be with you all. As, as we look at these salutations, they're easy to skip over or at least to miss some of the value that can be found in them. So to answer the question there that should be on the handout, yes, there are, are some things that we can learn as Christians today in the modern city of Elk City, and th there's something for us to be reminded of, to be encouraged by tonight, and it, it, if we had to put it in a pinpoint, it is hope, growing hope. Let's take note of those first two verses, Colossians chapter 1, the first two verses, and then we'll look at our three pieces of the puzzle. Colossians 1, at the beginning, at the very beginning of the letter, let's read a couple of verses here. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father. You get who this is from as far as the human author is concerned. Timothy, I believe, is giving his support to this. It seems likely he's there with Timothy or with Paul. Timothy's there with Paul when Paul writes this. And then you get the recipients. So you get it's from Paul, it's to these people. He doesn't just say to the people in Colossae. You'll note that and we'll even drop back up there momentarily. And then he gives this greeting of extending God's grace, divine grace, and divine peace to those recipients. And if we're reading it tonight as Christians, we could read it that way too. That this letter, not only here at this point, is the Holy Spirit extending this, but part of it is that as you read the rest of the letter, we're not going to do that tonight, but as you read the rest of the letter, even the next few verses where we are about to read, they're meant to bring with them a greater quality, greater amount even, both quality and quantity, of God's peace and God's grace in our hearts, hopefully in our lives. That's grace and peace given or invited to us tonight. Let's take note of the next few verses, verses 3 through 8, as we look tonight at this growth of hope in the Christian's life. You might say that verses 3 through 8 are still part of the greeting or the salutation, at least part of the introduction to the letter. He hasn't really reached the heart of what we would call, if we were, being, if we were looking at it from, a, from the rhetoric standpoint of how you write a letter, even in the ancient world, he hasn't reached the main body yet, for sure. But as verse 3 begins with him sharing his thanks for them, how he always does that, it's part of the greeting. It's part of his reminder to them of how he cares for them. Paul hasn't been there, but he has been responsible in large part for Christians in their, this area, in this Asia Minor, Turkey area, hearing about Jesus. And so Paul writes this letter to these Christians to remind them. And then you get verses 9 through 14 where he shares more of a different prayer he prays. There's a prayer of thanks for them in verses 3 and following. 9 through 14 is his prayer for their growth that comes right out of. It's the outgrowth 
of verses 3 through 8. You could say all of that, 1 through 14, is one big greeting from the Apostle Paul, or salutation. Let's start back at verse 3. And the first thing to notice this evening, under this overall idea of growing hope, salutation in Colossians 1, is the triad. The triad. That's going to be your first blank there, is the word triad. Now, I don't know this... I don't know how many people in here are going to think this. I, I almost chose a different word here, like trio or, I mean, there's some other words too that be maybe less appropriate. But when I think of the word triad, one of the things that pretty quickly comes to mind is a group of, of individuals in China. And so, anybody tracking with me on that one? Okay. All right. You know, it's a, a gang, in, a Chinese drug gang type thing with, that, that's known as the triad. It's a real thing. It shows up in mythical ways in fiction pretty often in movies and TV shows and even some books. So that is not, okay, what we're talking about tonight. So just forget I said anything about that. And you're like, how do I forget that? But just put that out. That has nothing to do with tonight's sermon. But when I, when I that, that word just, it fit really well here. And so that, that, I, that's a little insight into the, the inner preacher's mind there of the struggle of do I use this word? Is it going to be distracting? And now I've distracted you. See, it worked. But here's the triad. It is going to be something you've never heard before as a Christian. Ne- you've never heard this before. It's the triad, or the trio, we'll just use that word too, of faith, hope, and just take a good guess. What's that third one? Love. Okay, raise your hand if you've ever heard those three put together. I don't know what happened. This was supposed to really blow you away and surprise you. But that is the, that is the triad here in these verses, in verses 3 and 4, that then keeps going into the end of this paragraph. Faith, hope, and love. They're out of order here. I don't know if, if Paul wasn't reading what he wrote in 1 Corinthians 13. Okay, that, that's a joke. But this is really a, a common way of thinking about the essentials of a local group of Christians. What happens if even one of these isn't a part of who we are? What if one of these is lacking? in a severe way. Let's read it together. Colossians 1, 3 and 4. Here's where he expresses his thanks for them and part of why, or at least a a big part of why, he's so thankful for these Colossians. Colossians 1, 3 and 4, he says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith, And if you like, you can fill the handout out as we go through this. Your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for faith in Christ, love for people, or here he says, love love that you have for all the saints. And then, I I did the work for you there, hope reserved, or as the English standard says, because, verse 5, of the hope laid up or reserved for you in heaven. From 1 Corinthians 13 to Hebrews 10 and a few other passages, put Colossians 1, 3, and 4 on the list, these three, this triad, is common. It is very popular in the New Testament writings. That's a fact. But then the conclusion we could draw from that fact is that these are so fundamental to what it means to be a Christian. Not just individually, but here he's writing to a group, a a church, a congregation. And he says, we've heard about this. And apparently more than once, the way that it's written here, it's like, you know, we we started from the first time we heard, since we heard about this. It sounds like he's saying, we've been hearing reports. Epaphras has been telling us and others, the news is spreading about your faith in Jesus, how you believe in Jesus. You, you, could, th- you could look at that word faith and, and draw a line in your mind to other terms like loyalty, faithfulness. Look back, let your eyes go back to verse 2 when he wrote, writes to the saints or the holy ones and what? Faithful brothers in Christ. Those are from the same root word, faith and faithful in both English and Greek. These are people that they have such trust in Jesus that they 
they're loyal or faithful to Jesus. Now let your eyes go down to verses 13 and 14. Looking at the, the end of this other prayer where he's, he's, just, he's referring to their, their thanksgiving. He wants them to be thankful people. Verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Verse 13 and 14. I read verse 12. That's later. Well, it, but we, we, we've got it. Verse 13. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. Faith in Christ Jesus. Or what's another word for Christ? King. Messiah. And here in verse 13, this Son, this Jesus, he has a kingdom that if you're a Christian, you've been transferred into. So if you're in the kingdom, it makes sense then you'd have faith or loyalty to the king. And then verse 14, he says, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now connect all of this. Verse, verse 4, 3 and 4, or really, really verse 3, our faith is in Christ because we believe in Jesus and we're loyal to him. We're the people who are faithful, verse 2, in Christ. They're more about who we are as our identity. That's where we belong. We're in Christ. And it is in Christ, verse 14, that we have things like redemption and forgiveness. Faith in Jesus, then, is paramount. But then that faith is right in there with our love. We could say, well, shouldn't we love Jesus? Sure. But the emphasis here is on our faith, our loyalty to Jesus. I believe in Jesus, and that changes how I live. Part of how I live, then, is I love people. I love you. Paul isn't saying that we don't love those who aren't in the body of Jesus. But you'll find as you read the New Testament that we're supposed to have a special kind of love for our fellow Christians. The principle could be stated, in other words, as do good to all people, love everybody, especially, isn't that Galatians 6.10? Especially those of the household of faith. It's like if you had to put some type of hierarchy there, it's that my brothers and sisters come first in my life. I'm going to help other people and be kind and good and generous and caring and compassionate, but these are my family in Jesus. I love them. Let's move down to verse 7 of this same paragraph, 7 and 8. You might see that out beside that phrase there of love for people. Here he says that they had learned about this from Epaphras, our beloved, another form of love, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. This is an example of how some of this love works, where we minister, we serve one another. That might look like Epaphras sharing the gospel. It might look like someone preparing a meal and taking it to someone. It might look like a, a listening ear. Lots of things. And then this, look at the rest of verse 8. He says that he is this minister on your behalf and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Why does Paul come back to love? It, it, it makes sense on a practical level that love, the way they took care of each other, would be one of the most easiestly observed things. It's very, it can be very public, very noticeable. But it also seems from a more spiritual level that if you really want to get the, a finger on the pulse of a congregation's spiritual health, you look at their love. That's why he ends this sharing of, we're so thankful for what we've heard about you. And at the very end, he says, what Epaphras told us, he doesn't mention hope or love or faith there, it's he told us about your love, how you love one another. Faith in Jesus, love for people, and then that hope that is reserved. And the way that it's written in verse 5 is not so much that it's our emotion of hope, that, it, that, that it's referring to, as much as, he says, this hope is what's laid up for us in heaven. So whatever this hope is, it's the object of our emotion. It is what we're looking for. What is that? 
we, we could say, well, it's heaven. <laughs> but Paul says this is, the hope is in heaven. It's laid up for us. That's where it's waiting on us. It's reserved like reservations at a hotel, but on a very, mu a very much bigger scale of importance. What is that? Well, that leads us to our next thought. So let's wrap up this one by saying that these three are so, so essential. Faith, hope, and love. There's a reason the Bible talks about them so much, and there's a reason maybe we need to spend more time thinking and talking about them as well. And then that phrase, because of hope. Let's look at that one a little deeper tonight in verse 5. Because of hope. There's the faith and the love in verse 4. But he says that hope gives rise to our faith and our love. There's something about hope, here, the hope that we have, and then the emotion of hope that we get from that, that produces or motivates us toward faith in Jesus and love for people. You see that? That hope is like the foundation. By the way, do you see those little words out on the far right of the title words? Like it should have leaves and fruit and then stem and root. That's a, a word picture of looking at this whole sermon. And so the, the, the triad or the fruit or the leaves that the plant or the flower produces. But hope isn't just a fruit. It's also like the stem holding it up or the roots that give it stability, the foundation that supports it all. So faith and, hope, faith and love, if I can get the three in my head right tonight, they come out of, he says, your hope. Let's read a few more verses in Colossians about hope. He doesn't end here. We saw how he comes back to love. I better turn my Bible around the right way. But in Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, we saw the inheritance. We already read that one, so we saved time by getting ahead of ourselves. The inheritance of the saints, something I'm going to receive. So it's reserved, it's inheritance. Then you drop down to verse 23. He's talking about being faithful, loyal, if indeed, Colossians 1, 23, you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, what does that also mean? Not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. He comes back to it again in verse 26. This He's looking at the way that God has revealed this mystery about Jesus. Things that were not, that were hidden, now have been made clear. And so in verse 26, he says, The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, to them. God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory, that sounds like hope, of this mystery, which is Christ in you. The hope, there's the word, of glory. Back in back the earlier part of chapter 1, it was the saints in Christ. We were in Christ, in, in, whom, in whom we have redemption. Now it's reversed. Now Christ is in us. And something about that is hope. Well, where is Christ right now? Is he... In heaven, the hope laid up for you, and that hope is something about Jesus being in you, and you in Jesus. Look at verse 28. He says, Him we proclaim, we proclaim Jesus, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that, purpose statement, we may present everyone mature in Christ. When does that happen? Could it be that it happens at least in the final sense when Christ comes back to, cl to claim his own as we sing maybe skip a chapter to chapter 3 not that hope isn't important for chapter 2 but in chapter 3 verse 4 as he makes this application from immersion that we discussed this morning if then you've been risen with Christ seek the things that are above he says this in verse 4 when Christ, who is your life, Christ could be said, we could say Christ is our hope, now he is our life, 
When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in, there's that word again, in glory. So we have this inheritance that's waiting for us. It's something about glory and Jesus coming back. And then, verses 22 and 23 of this same chapter, he's writing to bondservants or slaves in the ancient world. This even affects the way that we, we could say that we could say the way that we do our jobs or whatever it is that we do on a daily basis. This isn't just some heavy head stuff. It's more than that. Verse 22 and 23 of Colossians 3, he says, Bondservants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, ouch, but with sincerity of heart. That ouch isn't in the text, okay? That was my own parenthesis. But with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. And then verse 24 continues the sentence, knowing that from the Lord you receive the inheritance as your reward. Remember, he said, you are serving Christ Serving the Lord Christ. And that this is where the two meet. Hope and daily living. Daily decisions. I, I have a hope set for me. Jesus is coming back. And with, with that means the inheritance of eternal life with Jesus. I lie free of all of the things that sin and Satan and death have ushered into our world that, that we know so well. And I hold that hope in my mind. And that heavenly mindset actually changes how I look at life now. But that's where that process versus results comes in. And, and you might think of the old Oliver Wendell Holmes quote. He said, some people are so heavenly minded, they're not any good for the, for the earth. Then C.S. Lewis came along and said that the people who are most heavily minded in history have done the most good for this world. Here's one way of thinking about it. In a, in a practical side. Look at the athletic context. If you're in a game and you get too busy scoreboard watching and all you can think about is we've got to win this game, we can't lose you're probably going to lose. What you have to do is focus on that moment. If it's something where you have plays, then you focus on that play, and then the next play, and the next play. Because if you're too big picture, you miss the moment. Now, how does that relate here? I think it is possible for us to become caught up in a kind of escapism, where it's, well, I'm going to heaven. It doesn't really matter here and in, in, on this earthly life. And we might as Christians become insensitive. I'm not, I'm not just speaking theoretically here. I, I might have seen this. We become insensitive to the plights of others. It's, well, it, you know, it's all, it's all okay. We're going to heaven after this is all over. Or we might think about it as we're going to entertain ourselves to get through until this life is over and then we go to heaven afterwards. It might be possible for us to spend our lives as Christians and we just get through and we entertain ourselves to death because this life doesn't matter, I'm going to heaven. That's one side. It's one possibility. The other is where that is the big picture, hope in heaven. But that is, that's meant to produce in me faith in Jesus and love for people in the moment. And in the moment, those, those decisions, some of them have to be made quickly. I have to learn to balance this. The process of loving people and the results, the goal, the reward of eternal life with Jesus. And those two aren't meant to be different we're meant to work together. That's why hope is tethered to our spiritual growth here. If you want more faith and you want more love, have real hope in Jesus. Real hope. For heaven will make us better people on earth. That's how it's meant to work. Both matter.
the here and now, and the future. That's because of hope. He says you have faith and love in Jesus. Let's back up one more time and finish this paragraph from the word. Here's the seed that makes this flower, that we're, this fruit possible. The seed is planted in our hearts. It produces the roots, the stem of hope, and the flower petals of faith and love. Go back to verse 5. We have to finish that verse and then read the next couple of verses of this passage. He says this about hope. He says, of this, in verse 5, so that's after because of hope that's laid up for you in heaven. You might even have a version tonight that doesn't have a new sentence starting there. In, in the original language, 3 through 8 is all one chunky sentence. And we don't write that way. We for sure don't speak that way in English today. People, get, you, get, you start trying to do that and you lose people. And so a lot of the English versions have broken it down in different ways. But he's referring to that hope. He says, of this hope you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel. Or literally, the word of the truth of the gospel. And again, that one's wordy, so we break it down. It's the word of truth. What is that? It is the gospel. What has the gospel done? The gospel has come to you, verse 6, as indeed in the whole world. It is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. And we're back to verse 7. Who first told you about it? Epaphras. So this word of truth, the, the truth of God's grace, do you see that parallel there in these two verses? They're on your handout. So something about the word, the message, that now is written down for us, they heard it, we read it and hear it. Something about that message, it is truth, it is God's grace about hope. And watch this, you can, that's going to be that word there, we're still keeping track here, you can understand it. Do you see that? He says you heard it and learned it or understood it. You ever had somebody tell you that you can't understand the message of the Bible? There's parts that are a bit tricky and difficult. There's some parts that if I, if I let them, they'd keep me up at night trying to figure them out. Maybe sometimes they do. But the basic message of the gospel, the word about God's grace, the hope that grace gives, that gives faith and love in our hearts and lives, that I know. You and I, we can understand it. And you look at the book of Acts, and they preached. Epaphras isn't mentioned there, but the others that preached, like Paul, what did they preach about? Well, Jesus. But the one thing they talked more than anything else about Jesus is hope. They don't always use the word. They use words like resurrection. Resurrection hope. Because hope comes from this word. It's like the seed, Luke 8, 11, That's the parable where Jesus says the seed that produces fruit is the word of God. The word of God is living and abiding and active in our hearts like the seed that produces our love, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1. So desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Do you want your hope to grow so that other parts of your spirituality can grow? That's going to come primarily from the word of God that is growing, he says here. Did you see that? He says it's, it's growing, it's increasing among you and also in the world. There's personal growth as a Christian. There's congregational growth spiritually and numerically, and then there is this gro growth on a global scale that's still happening. Think about how many people are hearing the gospel, and more so, how many people are obeying the gospel around the world currently. We don't see it as much in our culture right now, but it's still happening as it was in Paul's day in a global way. That's what happens when a human heart receives the word of the grace of God that gives them hope from a pagan world and they start being faithful to Jesus in his kingdom and loving.
people. The pagan world of Paul's day, not unlike our pagan world, there wasn't much about hope. If you went to a graveyard in a Roman graveyard in Paul's day, you would find things like this. Here's your epitaph. I was not, I became, I am not, I will not be. And to that world, and a world today that tries to tell us, there's no hope after this, there's nothing after this. The gospel says, there is a hope laid up for you in heaven. Jesus is coming back to give you an inheritance like nobody else could ever give you. In the meantime, that hope, will make you a Christian and make you a Christian who believes in Jesus and loves their family in Jesus. The invitation is yours this evening to be a part of that, to be continue to participate in a local work where those three, faith, hope, and love, are seen and enjoyed. And this isn't one of those sermons where the preacher says, well, I don't know. No. I've seen some of the other things I talked about, but I've also seen, and that wasn't just, I wasn't just thinking here then, but now I'm thinking here, Second Adams. I'm thankful for your faith, your love. I've felt it and seen it. And I'm thankful for the hope that we have together. Let's stand and sing together.